Thank you guys for attending. And for those of you online, thanks for being with us for our first speaker series of the season. Um, we're really excited to have attorney Nancy Potter here to talk about spe special education law. Um, before I, I introduce her and let her introduce herself, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, the restrooms are right around the corner, so you can go out either door and it's on the other side of the wall. There's bagels and coffee and muffins in the back, so please help yourself. And um, you know, if you have any questions, I'll let Nancy explain to you how she likes to proceed with that. But for the people online, you are able to ask questions as well. So just kind of raise your hand in the box and, uh, and we will repeat all the questions from the audience back as well. So for those of you, on, those of you that are online can, um, can hear it. And as always, we like to thank United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania for their support of Achieve a Family Trust. It's because of uh, the work we do with them that we're able to have these speaker programs and I do have a, a list up here of our next upcoming, three upcoming speaker programs through December, so please take a look. And as always, if you can't make one of our speaker programs, uh, you can listen live via webinar the day of the program, or the program is uh, saved and then put on our website, usually the Monday after the program, or Friday afternoon. So you can go back and listen to it as well. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Nancy, and she can tell you a little bit about herself. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me, and thank all of you for being here and dialing in. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nancy Potter. I'm an education rights attorney. Uh, I've been doing this work for about 10 years. It's all I've done in my career. Um, and I'm fortunate that I, I recently moved back to Pittsburgh. I, I started my career here in Pittsburgh representing kids in the foster care system uh, through an organization called Kids Voice and then really um, started to do what I, what I found at that organization was my students whose lives seemed very chaotic who could get the education piece in place, who could, those with disabilities could get fate set up in their school district, that school piece could kind of be the calm in the storm. And those students could not just survive, but really thrive, regardless of what else was going on in their life when that education piece was in place. Um, that was very powerful to me and really continued my development of the specialty around education rights, education, civil rights, and student rights. Um, I spent some time here in Pittsburgh at the Education Law Center and recently, uh, most recently, moved to Philadelphia to work at the Office for Civil Rights for the U.S. Department of Education, where I enforce student rights in schools, universities, and institutions around the country. Um, but this spring, I was given an amazing opportunity to move back to Pittsburgh, a city that I loved and missed so much, um, with a firm that was started in, in the 80s by Dennis McAndrews, who so many of you know, respect, and are familiar with. Um, we were McAndrews Law Offices and have been that for a very long time. If you've been on our website or get our email blast, you'll see that we are now McAndrews, Mihalik, Connolly, Hulse, Ryan, and Marone. Um, we just changed our name to recognize some of the attorneys who have been with us for a very long time doing really, really great work. Um, but we're still the same, we're still the same folks there. Um, and our practice really is twofold. We have a group of attorneys, myself included, um, led by Mike Connolly, who's the head of our education department, who do education rights work. So for a lot of that is special education work on behalf of students with disabilities. Um, but for me, that includes students from, you know, really from birth all the way through a PhD program and issues around disability accommodation, student discipline, um, enrollment of special populations, Title IX, Title VI, when we're talking about racial harassment or, or, or um, or gender harassment or, or mistreatment. So we really, in the education side, um, serve students and families um, wherever they may be. If you wanna to go to school, we wanna help you get there, is, is kind of what we do there. Um, and then in our states and trust practice, kind of the other side of our practice, um, which is led by Leslie Mihalik, we represent and help families doing states and trust um, life planning. And a lot of that is special needs planning. Uh, and, and our firm really has a specialty in serving families and individuals with disabilities um, and making plans not just for the end of life, but really for your whole life. What's the best way um, to use trust? What's the best way to utilize the systems that have been set up to make sure that um, individuals with disabilities are getting everything that they need and all the supports that are available to them to have an integrated and successful life? Um, and we're really fortunate here in our Pittsburgh office. I, our Pittsburgh office is our, our, our sixth office. Um, myself doing the education side, 
And then Jillian Zachs, who so many of you have already said to me today how great and wonderful she is. Um, she is my, my, my other half here in Pittsburgh, and she does the estates and trusts and, and the special needs planning piece here. Um, I also wanted to mention to you all, as we're here today, I am happy to answer questions as we go. So I would much rather answer questions at the slide than wait to the end, though, of course, if you have questions at the end, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but when you're gonna, if you have really individual questions about a specific client, oh, some familiar faces. Um, if you have specific questions, that will, that's something that would be better answered probably one-on-one, -on -one, um, and I'm happy to do that later on. But I wanted to note that we have, uh, myself, McAndrews, and, and Achieva have partnered together to put on three free education rights clinics um, coming up in the area. So I'll be here on October 17th, and then I'll be in Beaver County on October 15th and Westmoreland County on October 10th. Um, and those are something that McAndrews has done for a very long time, uh, IEP clinics, where you can bring in your documents, you can bring in your education records, you can bring in your questions about your specific students, and get an opportunity to sit down with myself or one of my colleagues um, to go over that, to strategize about next steps, to look and see at, at whether there's some concerns there that need to be addressed. Um, and then the last thing I'll tell you about McAndrews and really the way that we, serve, we, we try to serve clients um, is if you do have an issue, if you think something's going on, you can always call our office um, and, and talk to our staff and, and do an intake. And basically what our intake system does is we ask you a lot of questions, we try to get as much information as possible, we give you the opportunity to give us any education records you have. And then um, if you're out here, myself and my um, fantastic assistant Amy review those and then we'll meet with you for a, a free consultation. Um, and that's something that we always do for free for families with special education needs. Um, and really what that gets for you regardless is a nice review of your records, um, a plan, and, and, and usually about an hour, sometimes a little bit longer meeting with an attorney to talk about next steps. So um, that's those of you who have asked, like how do I get in touch with you? What would that mean if I come to you? That first call, that first meeting, that file review of records is something that we um, provide to families free of cost. So something I always like to do when I get started is just get a little bit of a feel for the room. Um, and and I, I can't do this with the WebExers, but for those of you that are here, I'm just interested in how many of you have children who are getting services through an IEP or under the IDEA right now? How many of you are service providers? Okay. Uh, educators? Okay, great. How many of you have students in post-secondary? Okay, and then how many of you have students who are in the K-12 or early intervention age group? Okay, fantastic. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is really that whole expanse of what different points in your life you're a student and what rights um, and support you have available to you during that time. So one of the strongest rights that any student in this country has is providing students with disabilities under a law called the IDEA. Um, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act is a federal law that sets out how states and under those state school districts are supposed to provide education to students with disabilities. Um, and those of you familiar with Achieva and, and familiar with the disability rights movement know that Pittsburgh in particular and attorneys in Pennsylvania were very, um, were, were key players in getting the IDEA passed and making sure that students with disabilities are being served by their school districts. And really the core right that we see, and this is all alphabet soup I know, so the IDEA is the law, the core right that the IDEA provides is called FAPE free and appropriate public education. So we're gonna break down what those different words mean. Um, but most often when you hear people talking about special education, they're talking about rights under the IDEA, and they're talking about how do we get students faith, free and appropriate public education. And the law defines that as follows, a program reasonably calculated to afford meaningful educational progress. And all those little phrases mean something special that we're gonna talk about as we go in all domains, academic, social, emotional, behavioral, physical, 
through a proper IEP, another alphabet soup for us, Individualized Education Program. So the IDEA sets forth FAPE. FAPE is provided in a way that's set out in an IEP. The IEP, we'll talk a little bit more about later, but the IEP is really the written document that's almost like a contract between the family and the school district about how that student is going to receive FAPE. Hi. Always good seeing familiar faces fill the room. So what is, what is special education for? Um, why was special education developed? At the end of the day, special education is really about moving a child, moving a student to a reasonable level of independence and self-sufficiency that's consistent with their potential. Um, and we do that by providing students with specially designed instruction. Another piece of our alphabet soup that you'll hear a lot, SDI. Um, but those SDIs, that specially designed instruction, must be based on peer review research. So a school district can't just decide that the best way to serve a student with a specific disability is something that they've just come up with. It has to be based on some sort of peer reviewed research. Um, because for so many of these things, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, right? People have done research, they've been doing the work, we know evidence-based programs that work. So that's why SCI needs to be based on peer-reviewed research. And the way we make sure that students are able to make meaningful educational progress is by prov providing them accommodations and support. Those accommodations and supports must be provided as necessary and they have to allow the student to make meaningful educational progress, number one. Number two, they need to have maximum integration with non-disabled peers. That's the law's way of saying it. I say peers without disabilities, but um, that's important when we talk about later on more of our alphabet soup, LRE, our least restrictive environment. And then lastly, those accommodation supports allow a student to participate in extracurricular and non-academic activities. Um, the other thing that FAPE provides, which in the world of special education has you know, been on paper for a long time, but really uh, I think has just be become a topic that we're getting better at and paying more attention at, are transition services. Transition services under the federal law say that once students are at least age 16, they need to be provided transition services. Um, those services need to be consistent with some sort of a appropriate transition assessment. And again, specifically designed to improve the child's academic and functional achievement. The services should facilitate the child's movement to post-school activities. Um, in Pennsylvania, we actually require transition planning to start at age 14. So once a student is 14 years old, in Pennsylvania, we want to be thinking about what are post-secondary goals, what are students, uh, and what should the school district be doing to help that student achieve those post-secondary goals. Now, another time, I'm going to get Patty to let me come back and just do two hours just on transition planning, because I feel really passionately about transition planning. And one of the reasons I feel so passionately about that is that I think it is a travesty for our students with disabilities to, I get to just one second, for our students with disabilities to get out of high school and not know anything about the disability rights movement, not know anything about what their rights are as an individual with disabilities in our community, and what their rights are if they do decide to pursue some sort of post-secondary education. Um, and transition goals can be written so that the school district's responsible for teaching a student. What do you do when you get to CCAC and you need accommodations or academic adjustments in your classes. Who do you go to? How do we train students in high school to be able to self-advocate to get what they need and then to report an institution who doesn't give that to them? So stay tuned. That's a preview of a coming attraction um, that I'd love to talk more with you about sometime. Yes, sir. Well, and then our question is, as a provider, I have met several Absolutely. So for those of you listening online, that's where, that's where other people are 
Yeah, I, I, one of our one of our audience members who's a parent and a provider just mentioned that he'll often see see students um, and their families, and the students are around 21, who are really at a loss and, and really upset because they they don't know what the plan is, they don't know what to do now that their students hit 21. And we should be utilizing transition services, transition planning, and holding school districts accountable to that to make sure that our students have a plan and know what that is. And transition planning and transition goals aren't just learn to ride the bus, which is a very important transition goal, but it shouldn't end there. That shouldn't be the last thing that we're doing. I, one comment. Sure. I think the kids that have their parents freaking out are actually the lucky kids, because there's a whole bunch of kids that their parents know so little about what's going on that they don't even know how to advocate for them. Absolutely. And so the kids that are getting the services are already the kids that already have a bunch of things around them that probably are advantages. Someone. Sure, sure. Our, our, our audience member for those online was just making a comment about um, that students whose parents are getting services and at least know to be freaking out about what's going on um, as much as they're struggling. Like, we, we also have to remember that there's students whose parents don't even know that these services exist or don't even know that they should be talking about transition and getting that information out to the community is so important. And that's part of why we're here today. Okay, so FAPE requires that students are placed in the least restrictive environment consistent with their needs. This is a big, big issue, um, and it's something that we, we see school districts and families, providers struggle with to this day. But at the end of the day, what this means is that students should be placed to the extent possible, right, with their peers without disabilities in a regular education setting. Um, least restrictive environment for some students is a private placement. I have some clients who at this moment, least restrictive environment for them is in-home instruction, which is in fact the most restrictive environment, right? So each of these determinations have to be made on an individual basis. There is not a one size fit all. Um, but our goal and the legal requirement is always least restrictive environment. The other thing kind of like transition planning I think sometimes we forget about is extended school year. Um, students are eligible for extended school year when their regression occurs over summer or other school breaks and they're unable, they have a limited recruitment ability um, or where children otherwise aren't making meaningful progress on their IEPs. Now, extended school year does not just mean summer school. Extended school year can sometimes even mean over the weekend support. It can mean over winter break or spring break support. Um, the other thing is extended school year doesn't just mean for the summer, summer school provided by the school district. So we have, um, you know, I've worked with, with families who extended school year might mean a, a horse riding camp um, where we're, maybe we're working on transition goals because that child has a long-term goal to be, to be a, a vet tech. Um, or we have students, one of my favorite things in Pittsburgh, the Joey Travolta Film Camp. Um, we use that as an ESY program, right? It's a great placement where we have students who need to work on social skills and, and are learning um, how to better interact with each other. And, Certain camps like that are set up for students with disabilities to teach them those skills. Um, but extended school year programs, I can't tell you over the past few weeks how many parent groups in this region have asked me, can you just come out and talk to us about extended school year? We don't understand it. We're not sure what our options are. And the school district is telling us our only option is the school's cyber program. And that's just not true. Again, individualized. Everything under the IDEA should be individualized. So who is eligible under the IDEA um, for services? This is the, the iteration of the IDEA in 2004, sets up out some specific disabilities, autism, deaf blindness, deafness, emotional disturbance, um, hearing impairment, intellectual disabilities, multiple disabilities, orthopedic impairments, the kind of catch-all that seems to be really popular right now, other health impairment, everybody, I have so many clients coming in with OHI. Um, we also see under the IDEA eligibility for students with a specific learning disability, teacher language impairment, traumatic brain injury, again, students may not be born with a disability, right? Something could happen in their life that leads them to have a, a qualifying disability under the IDEA with more attention being paid to concussion issues and youth sports. Um, that's something where the TBI does come up, visual impairment and, and development delays. So, everything we've been talking about
talking about right now is the IDEA. Like I said, this is the federal special education law. But when I talk about disability rights and disability civil rights, the core disability civil rights federal law is Section 504. Now, a lot of us know about that. Maybe you've heard people talk about a 504 plan. Or maybe when you first asked for services or had concerns about your students, the school district said, well, let's not go to special education yet. Let's start with a 504 plan. Um, what I'll say in general is every student covered by the IDEA has rights under 504. Not every student covered by 504 has rights under the IDEA. So the IDEA is a smaller subsection of students. Section 504 can cover students much more broadly. broadly. For example, um, I have clients who have diabetes. It doesn't affect their learning. They, they're not eligible students under the IDEA for any sort of specialized instruction. They don't have an entitlement to FAPE in that way. However, they need some special rules at school about having access to insulin, access to um, blood monitoring, access to certain foods. And we can do that through a 504 plan. 504 plans can be used really um, creative ways for students with, with um, anorexia, for example, that's, or body dysmorphia. The 504 is a really great way to help students in a variety of ways who need their school day to look different, but that doesn't affect their learning. Um, the other important thing to remember about Section 504 is while the IDEA stops at high school, Section 504 protects students in CTE or VOTEC programs. It protects students in undergraduate classes, community colleges. In fact, it protects students all the way through a PhD program, all the way through law school or medical school, nursing programs. Those 504 protections stick with you as a student all the way through. Um, the big thing about the Section 504 and why it's more broad is that it defines definition it defines an individual disability as someone who has an impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And learning is a major life activity. So when the IDEA in its very first iteration came to be, one of the biggest issues was students with disabilities were in communities and school districts didn't know it, right? Because those students hadn't been allowed in the school buildings. Those students were maybe in private programs or maybe just sitting at home with mom and dad all the time because mom and dad have been told that those students aren't allowed here, we can't teach those students, those students can't. <coughs> we all know that's not true. But that really led to this huge responsibility and huge right for students under the IDEA called child fine. What child fine says, the child fine responsibility says, is that the state, so in Pennsylvania, the state has some responsibility, but a lot of that's been passed down to school districts or IUs. Um, they must have an effect, policies and procedures, to ensure that all students living in the state who have disabilities, um, regardless of if they're experiencing homelessness or attending private schools, regardless of the severity of their disability, who are in need of special education services, are identified, located, and evaluated. Now, like I said, in the beginning, that meant things like school districts going around and knocking on doors and asking parents, do you have students in your home that we could be serving? Now what that looks like more often when we say somebody has a child fine violation is a student who's continued to struggle for years and the school district has never uh, asked the parents to evaluate. Or a parent who's continued to ask a district, I think my child has concerns, my child has issues, I would like for them to maybe they learn differently, and the school district doesn't um, ever evaluate that. Students who are repeatedly, you know, I have a, a client right now who was suspended like 54 times in one year and he's in third grade. Right? That's what we mean most often now when we talk about child find issues. But I, I say to parents often who, who I meet with the first time and, and I'll be asking questions and they'll say, I just can't believe I missed this or I really messed that up. Like, that's not on your shoulders. That's why we have child find because the law writers, the experts who were developing the IDEA at the time, the educators all knew that parents you're the expert on your child, but you are not the expert on disabilities. You are not the expert on the IDEA. And so parents, like, we are going to take that off your chest and say it is the district's responsibility, it's the state's responsibility to find these children. Um, child find also includes children who are suspected of having a disability. Um, child find covers students who are highly mobile. That includes migrant, immigrant children, refugee children. Um, 
it really it, it covers any kid that's in the state, really. So most states, um, the way that states have implemented this requirement varies. Um, oftentimes, for example, in Pennsylvania, if your child is in any, receiving any sort of services, we're looking at ages three to five, but for our school districts themselves, it starts at school age, um, most often. But how does the special education process start for someone who's never been involved in it before? The very first step to having a child receive rights services under the IDEA is an evaluation. Um, an initial evaluation is required when there's reason to suspect that a child has a disability. That could be that the parent has asked for an evaluation. I always tell parents, please ask for that evaluation in writing, um, whether that's an email or a handwritten letter and you keep a note that you wrote the letter, but we always want to make sure we're doing that in writing. But a verbal request is a valid request nonetheless. Um, and then if the evaluation, if the parents do allow a permission for the evaluation and the school district moves forward with it, which if the parent asks and the school district says no, the parent does have rights um, to go to a hearing to, to make the district do that. The evaluation itself should be sufficiently comprehensive to identify all the child's special education and related services needs. Um, whether or not it's commonly linked to the disability category where the child has been classified. We see this a lot where I have um, worked with students who maybe have depression and anxiety, um, and that's somehow you know, affecting or, or exacerbating some other disabilities that they have around learning. And we'll get assessments or evaluations back, and there's been no executive function, executive function assessment. So often executive functioning um, can be masked as just being associated with other disabilities, other learning disabilities. Um, but that's why it's important to say that whether or not the evaluation itself is commonly linked to the disability category that the child's been classified, it needs to be very comprehensive. It's very trendy now, um, and I, I, I say that with a little T. It's, it's just something that more and more districts are doing, more and more states are doing across the country, is a new evaluation procedure. Um, it doesn't feel that new anymore, but sometimes it feels very new. A response to intervention model. Um, so the ability achievement model in the past that we used to evaluate students relied upon a discrepancy between ability and achievement, and really what we would say was kind of a wait to fill process, um, which we think really cheated needy children um, in a way. Once a school district has performed, and I say school district, in Pennsylvania sometimes it's an IU that does the evaluation, How, what, depending on the age of your child and what, what region you're in. But once that evaluation has been performed and provided to the family, families have a right to get an independent educational evaluation if they disagree with the evaluation itself. And that evaluation has to be provided at public expense if the initial evaluation was not appropriate. Um, and usually what we're seeing when, in my office when we're arguing that something's not appropriate is that it hasn't been comprehensive enough, that they haven't assessed and tested the correct things, um, that they've done some sort of a minuscule assessment, or that it's been years since the child has been retested. So maybe you have a high school student and you look back and see they haven't had cognitive testing done since they were in third grade, even though they've continued to receive academic support services that entire career. Um, So once you've done an evaluation and, and received an evaluation report, maybe that's through the, the initial evaluation, maybe you've gotten an independent evaluation afterwards, the next step in the process is developing that individualized education plan. Um, and again, what the IEP means is the written statement, the written document for each child with a disability, individualized, it's developed, reviewed, and revised in a meeting with the IEP team. Who is the IEP team? It is the parents and the relevant professionals. And I think oftentimes, um, especially when, when parents are getting started in the special education system, is parents feel as if the professionals in the room are the IEP team telling them what they should do and that they just have to agree with that. And I just really want to empower all of you 
that as parents, you are an equal and valid member of that IEP team. I am also a huge student's rights advocate, so I believe that the student is also a very strong and important member of that IEP team, and depending on appropriateness as the child ages can depend on whether or not that student should be in the IEP meeting, but especially as our students start doing transition planning and get into high school, I think it's really important um, that they're part of that development of that plan. What should an IEP have in it? Number one, it should have a statement of the child's present levels of academic achievement and functional behavior. And what really holds hands with that is a statement of measurable annual goals. Um, so we want to know where is our student at right now and what do they need to do, what, what are their goals to try to reach this year, this quarter, this semester. The IEP should also include a description of how the child's progress is going to be monitored and how the reports of that monitoring are going to be provided to families. Most often those reports um, are provided, you know, they coincide with a report card, um, something like that, but you could certainly ask for more frequent updates, more frequent reports um, if needed for a specific student. In that IEP, we also want to see a statement of any education-related services, any supplementary aids that are going to be provided, and again, all of those based on peer-reviewed research to the extent practicable, and a statement of any program modifications and supports for school personnel. Patty and I are actually um, just talking about this at the beginning before we, before we actually started the presentation, is that so often when I see issues come up later on in a child's academic career, and the, and the parent will say to me, but everything was going so great, we had a great classroom teacher, a great special ed director, it wasn't all in the IEP, but here's all the things they were doing. And we don't want to let our kids' education um, rely on personalities, right? We love our schools, our schools are a part of our community, we feel like we're a part of our community in our schools, and so sometimes it's, it's uncomfortable to push back and say, you know, that, that reading assistance that you're giving her every day, it's working really well, and I really need that written down in the IEP. So don't just rely on personalities. Don't just rely on this is going really well, even though it's not written in the IEP. We want to make sure that the related services, supplementary aids and services, program modifications are all in our IEP. IEP should also include an explanation um, <clears throat> about what and why a child will not be participating with their non-disabled peers in any regular class and other school activities. <clears throat> it should include statements of any individual accommodations um, that are necessary for that child's academic achievement. And it should also um, state accommodations that will be on state and district-wide assessments. <coughs> Again, this is something we see often that um, is not written into the IEP that families just kind of rely on school districts to do, but we want to make sure we have that in writing. Okay, so we're going to jump back to our Section 504 for a second. Section 504, if you're a student who's only eligible under Section 504, or maybe you have both an IEP and some other disabilities that require a Section 504, that is called a service plan. That's the agreement between the school district and the family. Um, in Pennsylvania, Chapter 15 requires that, and it lays out um, services and related services. What are related services? Services are things that are provided, you know, outside of a classroom, outside of academic instruction to help students um, progress on their IEP goals. These could be things like counseling, um, diagnostic medical services, OT, PT. Those are things that I think we frequently think about with students. Um, one of the things that I actually think is really interesting that we forget often with related services is parent counseling and training. Uh, so sometimes an IEP can include a related service. Maybe your student had some assistive technology needs and you are not up on assistive technology or maybe you're like me and it's just not very intuitive for you how to use an iPad. Um, a related service could be that the school district provides someone to train you parent on how to support your student in using their assistive technology or train you parent on how to respond when your student has some sort of an emotional outburst or a meltdown um, that's consistent with the supports and services and program they're being provided in school. 
again, psychological services, recreation, um, <clears throat> speech and language services, transportation. That, yes ma'am. Oh, what would I count? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I like to argue under recreation, um, extracurricular activities, sports. Um, sometimes I'll also argue under the recreation aspect if I need to, things like timeouts, um, hallway walking, whatever that may be. Um, <clears throat> I, will, I will say that I am very biased. <clears throat> I have this like very deep, belief um, in the power of, I'm so sorry, <coughs> in the power of physical activity. Um, and so something that I work with a lot of families on is if their student is someone who's involved in extracurricular athletics, is under that recreation piece to say that the student's academic eligibility for their team will not be determined by whether they have an A, B, C, D, E, or F in the class. It will be determined by whether they're meeting their IEP goals. Um, <clears throat> but with recreation, also with ESY, I, make, I like to make a, a broad argument, and I don't think it's a I don't think it's a silly argument. Like I think there's a lot of um, evidence-based research to back up the importance of recreation for students with disabilities and being able to meet their IEP goals. Um, no, yeah. So with that, would you, what are some things that you consider like out in the community that's not necessarily cool? organization and outside organization. Um, the reason I'm asking, so with um, our educational trust that we have, we see related services in there. Um, and just knowing truly how far that recreational aspect of it can go, um, because it is taking like uh, toy play and hobbies and uh, interests and things like that. Absolutely. So in the in the context of a trust, as opposed to the um, <clears throat> provision of faith, the law does have a, does allow for broader uses. So things like buying toys to play with in the home or in the community, it would certainly be, um, you know, without knowing anything about a settlement agreement or what that trust looks like, but in general, those recreational activities can include, certainly can include things like camps, um, that's even for a student who's not ESY eligible. Um, they can include things like assistive technology in the home, even if the student's not eligible for assistive technology at school. And assistive technology for a kindergartner or a first grader, right, can look like um, magnet tiles, right? It, it can look, it looks very different perhaps than um, what those assistive technology looks like in, in high school. But, uh, I advocate, and, 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 I, and for the most part, I don't get much pushback from school districts. Um, in the confines, when we're talking about the context of a trust, and when we're talking about what qualifies under that, it's very, very broad. And that there's no what all is included list. Um, the list is really, here are some things that are included, but it is not confined to just this. So what would you say about, sorry. No. Um, what would you say about, like Kenny Wood. Kenny Wood. Kenny Wood. So in my, in my eyes, like <coughs> Kenny Wood, you, if you're getting physical activity, you're, you're having the patience to wait in line. Right, you're learning how to wait in line. You're learning how to follow the rules. Right. You're learning how to count your money out when you want right. to go buy to the potato patch. I would absolutely think that Kenny Wood tickets would be acceptable under a trust. Not legal advice, but <laughs> I mean, I, I I think I would have a much harder time convincing a school district that Kennywood tickets are related services in the IEP. But everything that they would be doing, absolutely, as an educational, but yes, social, emotional. Um, yeah, and I don't say those things tongue in cheek. I think those are very legitimate um, activities for a student to participate in while at Kennywood. There are things that I make my own. I mean, I was just at Kennywood a few weeks ago, and I made my three-year-old like. Here's five dollars. Walk up, look the person in the eye, say what you want, make sure you're using your polite words, right? Like that's what that's what we're doing, and, and students who have access to, to money through a trust in that way should be able to do that too. Okay. So, where are students going to receive these services? Where are they going to get the specially designed instruction? Again, least restrictive environment. We talked about a little bit earlier. We're looking at 
the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities, whether they're in public or private institutions, are educated with children who are not disabled. And any special classes, separate schooling, or other removal occurs only if the nature and severity of the disability is such that education in the regular class with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. And that doesn't mean it has to be across the board. So some students may need to have, be pulled out for part of the day. They may need to be pulled out and put in a, in a different setting for certain pieces of instruction, certain parts of the day. But just because that is true for a student in math doesn't mean that that is true for a student in social studies. And even students who least restrictive environment um, does look like some sort of removal of children from the regular classroom, that does not mean that they should also be in a separate lunch or have not have access to extracurricular activities. Again, each of these decisions should be individualized and should be individualized throughout the day for that student on what things look like. For example, I said earlier that I had a student who right now in the home instruction is um, LRE for her. However, as we're working to make sure that she can go back to the regular education setting, she's going to be joining um, her peers for lunch and study hall and getting back into the school building. So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing from the beginning of the school day to the end of the school day match. It also doesn't have to be a whole school year or even a whole semester, right? LRE for a student can look different in the first four weeks of school than it looks in the last four weeks of school. And that's important to remember. These things are individualized and they should be fluid. At least annually, again, anytime we see at least, that's just a guideline. We want to we make sure that if a student needs to be assessed for LRE after a semester, after a month, after a week, we're still doing that. Um, placement should always be based on the child's IEP and should be as close as possible to the child's home. Um, now, I certainly have some students who, for whatever reason, need to go to a school that's quite a bit far away. That shouldn't be a ban from a student getting to go. If it's appropriate, if the child is, can handle the transportation, if given the right supports and services, and the place they can receive FAPE and LRE is an hour away, and, that's, you know, and, the, and the family and the IEP team all together agree to that, that's not a reason not to do it. But we do want to always be trying to get that child as close to their home as possible. Who would pay for that child to be transported if it was an hour away? The district. And there's not a specific mileage, like was it <clears throat> within no. 10, 20? No. I mean, I know there are some, there are, there are reimbursement provisions between um, districts and, and the state. But that doesn't, should not affect these decisions, and there's certainly no hard and fast rule. Even though, I mean, right, we, students are not entitled to the best placement. It just has to be an appropriate placement. And students aren't entitled to, um, you know, if you live in this school district and you think that school district over there is better, they're not entitled to that sort of transportation, um, which is sometimes a shock to some people. But. Absolutely. So our, our audience member was just reminding me, which is good, um, that we do have some students and, and, and some students in, in the dependency system, but also <clears throat> students who, who are not in the dependency system, who are placed in group homes or RTS um, outside of their, the, the district that their parents reside in or they resided to previously. And those students in those institutions are still entitled to LRE. And LRE does not mean the on-ground school in the basement of the group home they live in. Um, they're entitled to enrollment in that school district. Um, there's been some, some um, locally famous litigation around that um, that I would be happy to tell you more about if you're interested in, um, about students um, who were in the McKeesport School District um, who uh, uh, were represented by, by Kids Voice um, and, by, um, and by the Education Law Center. Um, but yes, absolutely. Those students, regardless, not, you don't just lose these rights if you're no longer living with your parents. You retain these rights wherever you go. The LRE should provide a continuum of placements. Um, and those 
Placements from the school district must be maintained and available to meet children with disabilities. This includes things like instruction in regular ed, special ed classrooms, special schools, home instruction, instructions in hospital institutions, which comes up quite a bit here in Pittsburgh because we do have families coming in to, um, to get access to, to our world-class world uh, children's hospital. Um, as we talked about a little bit, residential placements for educational purposes, this overlaps. Um, if placement in a public or private residential program is necessary to provide special ed, um, that also must be at no cost to parents of the child. Oftentimes when a student is placed in something like an RTF, their insurance or the county program that they're in covers that cost. However, if it is necessary for a child to receive FAPE for them to be in the RTF and it's not being covered otherwise, the school district is responsible for that. Um, and there's, there's varying layers of that. So sometimes the county will pay for the placement for the residential piece and the school district will reimburse them just for the educational piece if the child's receiving that in an on-ground school at something like an RCS. Like I said, instruction in the home, that is our most restrictive um, placement in general. That is different than homebound instruction. Homebound instruction um, is, is based upon a medical reason to provide instruction in the home. Um, instruction in the home itself is a special education placement. And all of those are different than homeschooling, which is a parental choice to provide that instruction um, rather, than, rather than through public school. Students in private schools um, in Pennsylvania have, quite frankly, you lose a lot of your student rights and civil rights once you go into a private school. But Pennsylvania does lay out the ability for dual enrollment, Act 89 services, and equitable participation um, for students who are in private school placements. Um, the child find obligations extend to private school students, but there's no due process rights of students in private schools to challenge almost all decisions by public agencies requiring their services. Um, there can still be some child find disputes, um, but for the most part, once you've, you've taken your student out and either homeschooling them or have them in private school, these rights do decrease dramatically. Not to say that you know, for a particular family that might be the decision you need to make, but nonetheless. Okay, so once you've done this process, your child has an IEP, your child is receiving special education, and some sort of dispute arises, who is supposed to help you out in this dispute? Who decides whether the school district or the family is right? Um, all of that is decided through something called due process procedures. And typically those, the first, the first person you go in front of to decide that would be a hearing officer. Um, the hearing officers in Pennsylvania are appointed by the State Department of Education, and they hear disputes involving children's identification, placement, and program. Um, so in theory, and I, I use that very loosely, in theory, the due process system is supposed to be set up so parents need not be represented by counsel. But have any of you, if you're comfortable sharing, ever seen or been involved in any way with a due process hearing? Okay. Let me tell you what a due process hearing looks like. Watch law and order. That is what it's like. You have, the school district's always going to have an attorney. You're going to have experts. You're going to have binders and binders of evidence. You're going to have a hearing officer who's really like a judge sitting up at the front. You're going to have witnesses sitting where they're supposed to sit, being asked questions by their own attorney, and then being cross-examined. If you yourself as a parent call a witness, or, 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 or maybe your co-parent as a witness, that person will be cross-examined um, by, by attorneys from the school district. So while in theory it's set up to be a process that does not necessitate counsel, the chances of success are markedly improved with legal representation. You can pull the data on this and see it. It's, Parents who represent themselves pro bono are frequently not successful. Um, and it's because the other side's never gonna be pro bono. That's just not ever going to happen. Um, the other thing is that when a parent is successful in a due process, the public agency, the school district, is responsible for the attorney fees for that parent. Um, 
So different attorneys handle this differently. At our firm, for example, in general, if we represent a family and we go to due process, we don't charge the family any of those fees. We instead, you know, take on the risk of whether or not we'll win, but presuming we win, then the school district will, will pay the, those attorney fees directly. Um, what happens if you win a due process hearing? Relief from due process, which can be a really scary thing to enter into, but it really includes a vastly superior school program, lots of times additional related services, tuition reimbursement, um, if a private school is appropriate, compensatory education. Again, this isn't part of the alphabet soup, but something that's frequently abbreviated comp ed, that's what compensatory education is, um, which is to provide services for past school district failures to provide FAPE. It could include payment for outside evaluations, alternative educational placements. It really runs the gamut. And so I think for so many families, and I certainly understand this and feel this, um, you know, number one, you don't want to be litigious. You don't want to be seen as, as that, that parent or that family, and it's really scary. Um, the other thing is, and I, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, is that school districts for so many of us are the center of our village. They're the center of our community. And that's a really important bond that families are fearful to break. Um, and filing due process or disagreeing with the school district, or even just going to talk to a lawyer, sometimes for a lot of families it feels really scary. It feels like maybe some sort of like betrayal of their kid's classroom teacher who they love so much, even though they know they're not getting what they need. Um, and so, I just say to you that due process, um, while it can feel scary from the outside, and there's certainly intimidating moments within it, if you have a trained attorney and advocate to hold your hand through that process, it makes it a lot less scary. Um, and I think, I won't say this is true for, for everyone, but certainly for myself, when I'm representing and working with a family whose goal is to keep their child in a school district to successfully graduate from that program, I'm constantly thinking about how can we build relationships, how can we build bridges between the family, between the school district, so that this student can successfully go through school with good relationships. Um, and I think, too, for the most part, teachers get it, right? No one wakes up someday and says, oh, I hate children and really want to be wealthy. I think I'm going to be a public school teacher. For the most part, these teachers love your kids, and, and, and quite frankly, for the most part, we get these calls in the middle of the night sometimes. It's like, I, I, I'm not supposed to tell you what's going on, but I need to tell you what's going on. And parents get, get supported by teachers into asking for additional help um, by those classroom teachers so often. So I go off on that little tangent a bit just to say that filing due process, enforcing your student rights, is not about burning a bridge with your school district. Oftentimes it's about building a bridge, about how do we move forward to make sure my child's successful, and how do we make sure that my other children who may not be in special education um, aren't affected by any sort of argument I'm having with the school district. And at the end of the day, the nice thing is you have this other person, this hearing officer, who is gonna make the decision, which I think a lot of times leads to some repaired relationships between parents and school districts. And if attorneys are involved, um, you know, oftentimes the attorneys can kind of fight out the details while the parents and the school district continue to move forward with what, what the future looks like and let the attorneys do the backwards looking stuff about how to fix and, and right the wrongs that were done. But sometimes it's the, the higher-ups in the school district who are in the background and maybe, you know, not allowing the Absolutely. For those of you at home, just a little, a little bit of conversation from our audience here about just a reminder that oftentimes the, the classroom teachers aren't the ones making the decisions that you're disagreeing with. Um, so just to alleviate some of that fear, I think, that we all have that our classroom teacher might take something personally or be upset with us. Um, I'll also say you can get on the PDE website and see how many of these types of complaints have been filed against your school and maybe make yourself feel a little bit better that you're, you're not going to be on an island doing this by yourself. take a little moment here before we jump into um, post-secondary education and those rights of students with disabilities. And we'll talk a little bit about transition there as well. Um, just to back up and say, okay, that was a whole lot I threw at you pretty quickly. My goal of all this information and even the goal of this PowerPoint is not to give you all the answers. Quite frankly, it's not to give you any answers. It's so that when you see something, you know to ask a question. When you see something, you know that there's a red flag. 
Um, so I don't want you to feel as if you need to be retaining every piece of everything I'm saying. Um, but I do want you to feel comfortable that you understand enough about this process if it is new to you, um, or if pieces of this process, even if you've been involved in it, are new to you, that you understand them and you understand those concepts and kind of what is this alphabet soup. So I just want to take a little um, moment before we jump into post-secondary to give anybody an opportunity, if you haven't asked questions, to ask questions, to talk about clarification. Those of you that are online, um, this would be a great time to send a question through our, through our WebEx, um, and I'll be happy to answer those. Yes, ma'am. I have one question about why those who are in um, So the question from the audience is whether or not schools need parent permission to institute a 504 plan. Um, and the answer is yes. I mean, the rules are much looser around a 504. We don't even necessarily need some sort of a formal evaluation. Oftentimes it's a note from the doctor. Sometimes it's something that's um, offered up even by a school nurse to, to, to start that. But a 504 plan, like an IEP, is something that's signed, um, that the parents agree to. Um, so a school district can't really implement a 504 plan without parent permission. Um, but it is looser than the requirements of an IEP. Um, the other thing I do want to touch on when, I, when we're saying parent um, is I, I really should use a more inclusive term, but whoever the educational decision maker is for that student. So oftentimes that's a parent, a grandparent, some sort of a guardian, a family member who that student's living with. Um, some students, uh, those of you, I think there's someone in the room who emailed me that works with um, unaccompanied youth, what, what we used to call runaways. Um, those students can be appointed what's called a surrogate, um, and that surrogate is the educational decision maker because in Pennsylvania, um, students aren't allowed to make their own special education decisions. They have to have a surrogate appointed for them. This is like a lifelong goal of mine <laughs> to get that changed because in many other states, once a student um, is, of a, is either emancipated or, or is of, um, you know, over 18 of an age, they can consent to their own special education decisions. And for pregnant and parenting students um, and unaccompanied uh, students, that can be a really important right for them to be able to self-advocate and ensure that they're getting the special education services they need. Yes, sir. So the question is, since the 504 is a different law than the IDEA, do I need to work with the special education department or director to develop a 504 plan? And the answer is most likely yes. Um, so school districts need to have a 504 coordinator. Oftentimes the 504 coordinator and the director of special education are the same person. That's not always true, but it's often true. Yes. Call me. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the, so the question online um, is whether or not it's too late for a 20-year-old who's been out of school for 20 years to participate in transition services. Um, and my answer is that horrible lawyer answer. It depends. It depends on so many things. It depends on when he educa exited education. Um, but I will say that if, if for whatever reason that transition services through his district or through an educational institution are not, he's no longer eligible to receive those, um, I would encourage you to reach out to OVR and their transition services um, as soon as possible because there is a wait list and it's a very challenging time for at OVR, but that is an additional place where transition services reside. Um, but if your student is less than two years out of high school, and did not receive, receive transition services or transition goals, um, there, may be, there, may, there may be some legal ramifications of that. Um, so it's not too late. Regardless of whether it's your educational institution or some 
agency like OVR transition services should still be a thing that are available to your students. Yes, sir. Is there a list of related services in the 504 or is What does a 504 plan look like? Well, no. What, it, what can it cover? So can it cover OT? Perhaps. I know. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. I, but here's the thing. Yeah, here's the thing. A student's strongest protections are under the IDEA. A student's strongest protections are protected by an IEP. Those are always going to be the strongest protections, always, always stronger than a 504. So if you have a child who's eligible for an IEP, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where I would advise a parent to get a 504 plan instead of an IEP. I'm not saying that would never happen, but it's highly unlikely. I'm just trying to get information on that. Yeah, absolutely. We're actually getting whispered hard by the uh, IU or whatever it is to uh, these services. And so we need to have options. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand. And that's, and I, I will say that my focus today on 504 is predominantly about what 504 looks like for kids after they've exited special education. So for kids who are going to post secondary and those 504 protections. Um, but two things. One is that uh, there, are, of course, are 504 protections for students K through 12. Um, but Section 504 is really an anti-discrimination statute, not a service-providing statute. So it's Section 504 is more about be, a student will not be punished because of their disability at school. So a student with um, with narcolepsy will not be punished for falling asleep in class um, like another student might be because that would be punishing them for their disability and that would be a violation of civil rights. As opposed to a student who has um, a, speech, a, a speech impairment needs to receive some sort of occupational or physical or speech therapy to progress with their speech developmentally appropriately. Um, which would be a service that's provided, which would be more inside what an IEP looks like. So one way to think about, especially in the K-12 setting, is that differences between IEPs and 504s loosely is that an IEP is really for students who need to receive services, um, oftentimes, or, or some sort of specialized instruction, whereas that 504 plan is for students who need to make sure that they're being able to operate in the school the same way that their non-disabled peers are um, for whatever their disability is. But it's, it's most frequently, 504s are most frequently um, used for students who don't need any sort of specialized instruction, don't need any support of those kinds of like classroom supports. Um, right, which is determined by the school's eligibility assessment based on progress for the education environment. So, That student needs an IEP. Right. Yeah. I understand. What What might you need if, if if you don't have the IEP? Can you get a 504? As opposed to, would I rather have a 504? Because you would rather have an IEP. Okay. Was there an online question? And I apologize for online comments who I forgot to repeat the last question for, but we were talking about whether or not a student um, with, would, would, what, a, what a 504 would look like for a young student um, who has, who's maybe on the spectrum or, or has something related to that. Okay. Let's talk about post-secondary then. So 
oftentimes what I've found is that parents don't know and students don't know that they have rights as a student with a disability after high school. Now, the fact is that once we get out of high school, we lose those IDEA rights. Um, and the IDEA, like I just said, is much, much stronger than 504. And it puts a lot of responsibility, especially around child fines, on the school districts or on the state to make sure that you're finding students who need help, make sure you're giving those students all the help that they need. So while students lose those protections, they keep their Section 504 protections through a post-secondary. Um, and the way that that's most often provided to students is through what's called academic adjustment. Now, you will hear people say all the time, including like my colleagues in the education law world, you'll hear people at universities, at community colleges use this word. Instead of saying academic adjustment, they'll say academic accommodation. It's the same thing. When people say academic accommodations in higher ed, they're talking about academic adjustments, but the actual law is academic adjustment. That's the, that's the term of art. That's what to use um, in Section 504. <clears throat> and what, what that says, what 504 says is that students with disabilities who meet academic and technical standards for admission to or participation in a post-secondary education program may receive academic modifications and auxiliary aids and services to ensure that they're equal opportunity to participate in that program. I want to be clear that when I'm talking about post-secondary, I am talking about CTE programs, what we used to call those tech programs. We could also be talking about apprenticeship programs. Really, anyone who receives money from the Federal Department of Education is covered by Section 504. That includes almost all public and private universities and colleges. There are a handful of private schools around the country who have opted out of receiving any sort of federal grants or allowing their students to take out any federal loans so that they're not covered by federal civil rights laws like Section 504, like Title IX, like Title VI. But with all of that said, almost every post-secondary institution is going to be covered by this because almost everybody wants to take student loans. That includes for-profit universities. That includes for-profit cosmetology schools, trade schools, um, IT programs. Um, it is very rare that Section 504 does not cover a post-secondary student, regardless of what that post-secondary environment looks like. <clears throat> so what do academic adjustments look like? Um, we're still looking at individualized decisions when we're, when we're in Section 504, when we're in post-secondary. So the appropriate academic adjustment must be determined based on disability and individual needs. Those academic adjustments might include auxiliary aids. They might include services. They also may include modifications to academic requirements as necessary to ensure that equal educational opportunity. There are various academic adjustments that I've seen over the years. Um, in general, we see things for students like arranging for priority registration or reduced course load. So many schools might require, say, 12 hours a semester to be a full-time student. We might be able to get that reduced for a student to nine hours or 10 hours or something lesser while they still qualify for all the benefits of being a full-time student. Um, providing note takers, providing recording devices, sign language interpreter, extended time for testing or quiet testing, um, equipping school computers with screen readers, with voice recognition or other adaptive software or hardware. However, there are things that the school is not required to do, which they would have been required to do in a K-12 setting. So in providing an academic adjustment, a high, an institute of higher ed is not going to be required to lower or substantially modify essential, essential requirements. In addition, they don't have to make any sort of changes that would fundamentally alter the nature of a service, program, or activity. Again, this is a huge difference from the IDEA. Or that would result in an undue financial or administrative burden, right? So under the IDEA, a school district can never say to you, oh, I'm sorry, your child who has Down syndrome cannot go to our school because we can't afford to educate that child. You cannot, I mean, you can say that under the IDEA. People say it but you're not allowed to say that under the IDEA. Under Section 504, that is not the case. A financial barrier can be an argument for why a school 
um, cannot provide an adjustment. Lastly, schools do not have to provide personal attendance. Um, they don't have to provide any sort of an individually prescribed device, so they wouldn't have to provide something like a wheelchair. They don't have to provide readers for personal use or study. So while the, the school may need to provide a screen reader to be in a particular computer lab, they don't have to provide a screen reader for a student to carry around with them to plug into any device that they need to use. Uh, they also don't have to provide typists or tutors. Um, so there's a realm of possibilities out there of what a student can receive and what a, what, what a university, college, go tech program should provide, but they also don't have to go nearly as far as our school districts do, need to do under the IDEA. Um, okay. Something that is a huge difference for our students when they get into these post-secondary education situations is that no one's going to sit at, no one's going to be required to sit at freshman orientation. You're not going to get some um, thing that comes up on your computer screen that won't let you proceed until you answer the question. No one's going to go around and ask every student when they enroll for classes, do you have a disability? Can we provide an academic adjustment for you? That is not going to happen. Students have to self-advocate for these academic adjustments. They have to self-advocate for accessibility. Um, which goes back to what I was saying earlier about why I think it's so important when we're doing transition services and building transition goals, especially design instruction around transition, to make sure that students are learning both that they have these rights in post-secondary institutions and how to ask for them. Most often, that means going to the director of student services, the director of disability services. Those are typically the people who are going, the offices who are going to be in charge of making sure that students get their academic adjustments. Oftentimes at a school, it's also on the students to provide notification of those approved adjustments to their professors themselves. Again, we want to teach students early on the self-advocacy so that they're comfortable walking up to a professor, to a teacher, and saying, hi, my name is Nancy, I have a disability, and here are the academic adjustments that have been approved for my use. Um, that is a really hard thing for a lot of students to do. It's a hard thing when I, I've worked with students who are going back to school in their 40s, and it's still hard for them to self-advocate with me on the phone with them right before cheering them on to go do the self-advocacy. So the earlier we start teaching our students this, the better. Um, outside of things like academic adjustments, what things look like in the classroom for students with disabilities, there's also a right for students to be able to have physical access um, physical access to the programs, services, and facilities. Now, I, I'll be honest. I have I've studied disability rights. I did. I went and did a study abroad just to study international children's rights and international disability rights. What those look like in other countries and how that works. And you know, when you're walking around. Um, another country, you might think, gosh, America has really done such a great job with the ADA, it's so accessible. If you have any sort of an impairment for being able to get around a mobility impairment, if you are a wheelchair user, and I just saw a tiny sliver of this when I started wheeling my children around Pittsburgh in strollers, you see how inaccessible this world really is. Um, and even though I think that you know, Senator Kennedy did a great job, and his colleagues did a great job with the ADA, we have a long ways to go with accessibility. So for students with disabilities who are on campus who have a mobility impairment in particular, this 504 gives them a lot of rights that are bigger um, and more real than just the ADA requirements for accessibility, right? So while a building might not have to go back and retrofit their building to provide access to every person who's a wheelchair user, they do have to make sure that their students have access to all of those programs and services. And sometimes that means we move it. Sometimes that means putting in a, a, a wheelchair lift as opposed to having to redesign a building or put in, a, um, put in an elevator. But students need to have physical access to programs, services, and the facilities. Old buildings may need to be renovated. New buildings must be properly constructed so that individuals with disabilities, including persons who use wheelchairs, can enter and navigate the facility. Also, we're not just talking about the buildings themselves. 
we're talking about parking lots. And we're talking about the path to get from the parking lot to the building, the path to get from the parking lot to Beaver Stadium. Those, there have to be accessible routes. Um, and that's not just for students to go to class. It's for students to go to the basketball game. The students who want to go support their school women's soccer program. There has to be an accessible parking, an accessible route, accessible seating, accessible bathrooms. Um, for, for individuals with mobility impairments or, or who are wheelchair users, these are huge issues. And studies have found oftentimes that when those students leave school um, and aren't able to successfully complete a program, it's often because of these physical limitations that they don't know that they have a right. Oh, I just go to the school, it's an old building, they wouldn't have to change it for me. And that's not the case. Um, have you, I, have a, I have a doubly here. That's how important it is. I put this slide in twice. <laughs> um, but, but the slide that's supposed to be here is as we move into a world where more and more of our university systems, our community college systems are done online, it's also important to remember that web accessibility is a huge right for students with disabilities. Um, so what does that mean? That means that a school's website itself, www.pit.edu, has to be accessible for a variety of users to be able to get to all the content on that website. Um, so that means things like closed captioning on every single video on the website. That means things like the website needs to be operable through your keyboard, not just through a mouse, for somebody who has some sort of a dexterity impairment. And that means that the, the website itself has to be specially programmed so that when I plug my screen reader into it, it reads back to me correctly what that page would read like if I was reading it with my own eye in a, in a natural flow. Um, and it also means that not only are we talking about the content on the school's web page, if the school uses Facebook or Twitter, that content needs to also be accessible. It also means, and where we really see the biggest issues for students, is things like Blackboard or WebCT or whatever they're calling their kind of, um, you know, virtual bulletin board that all students are using to access. Calendars, those things have to be accessible. For screen readers, really the biggest issue that I see is PDFs and calendars. So a professor will be uploading all the PDFs of all the PowerPoints um, or due dates onto this website, but the PDFs can't be read, read by the screen reader. Um, the other thing is for students who can't use a mouse, that dexterity issue, being able to navigate through a website. But as more and more of our education is provided virtually and through internet, we're no longer just talking about why doesn't this school have an elevator in their chemistry building. We're also talking about why can't my student access his chemistry homework through his screen reader when it's not uploaded properly on the website? So, again, when, when the student calls home or comes home from the day and is trying to get their work from CCAC and gets so frustrated because no matter what they do, they can't figure out how to get the screen reader to read the PDF, that's not their fault, right? That is an accessibility just as if a student who is a wheelchair user was, cannot get up the stairs to get to chemistry labs. So under the IDEA, we're looking at these due process proceedings that go in front of first a hearing officer and then eventually a federal court if you need to appeal after the hearing officer. What are we doing when discrimination occurs in a 504 stance sense and a post-secondary level? Practically every post-secondary institution must have a person, like I said earlier, <clears throat> in the K-12 sense, frequently called the Section 504 coordinator, the ADA coordinator, or the Disability Services coordinator, who coordinates the school's compliance with Section 504, um, Title II, or both laws. And I should have clarified earlier. Title II just makes the parts of Section 504 apply to some schools that tried to weasel out of having application to them. Um, the school must have grievance procedures. Those grievance procedures need to be available accessibly on their website, like we just talked about. And those grievance procedures should lay out steps to ensure that students can raise concerns fully and fairly. Um, it must provide for prompt and equitable resolution of complaints. School publications, such as student handbooks and catalogs, usually describe those steps, 
Again, they should be available on the website in an accessible format. <clears throat> so typically what happens if you're a student with a disability, you've been approved for academic adjustment, and let's say your history professor says, I'm not giving you extra time on the quizzes, like I don't care what the, the um, what the academic adjustment office said, we're not doing, I'm not doing that in my classroom. What does a student do? First thing a student does is go to those grievance procedures that the university has hopefully published and follow the outline of how to appeal or how to complain about something like that has happened, disability discrimination on campus. If they are unsuccessful with, or dissatisfied with the outcome of the school's grievance procedures, um, or if a student says, you know what, I don't trust the school to do this, I need to go somewhere else. Um, you can file a complaint against the school with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights or in a court. When we talk about the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, it's gotten more popular and more well known over the past probably decade, really around its work on campus sexual assault and Title IX. We hear a lot about that, um, Vice President Biden was a big proponent talking a lot about OCR and Title IX. In fact, those Title IX cases are a really small percentage of the cases that go on at OCR. More than half of their cases are related to disability rights violations. Um, and again, a, a lot of students don't know about this, but it's really important to know. You can go to the Office for Civil Rights. You can file a discrimination complaint with them. Again, it is a system that is set up for people to proceed in a pro bono way. Um, I would say it's a little bit more successful than the due process system being set up for people to proceed without attorneys, but this is a service that we provide, it's a service that attorneys do to be able to hold your hand through that process and advocate for you through that process as well. What happens with OCR is you file a complaint with them, it's an online complaint form that you fill out, which is accessible, and once you file that out, fill that out, um, an investigator from the Office for Civil Rights will be in touch with you, to, sometimes to ask more questions. Based on what you said, if they open an investigation, then they are the ones who go to the university, go to the community college, go to the VOTEC program, ask for records, review, try to figure out what they're not doing. <clears throat> Oftentimes, at the Office for Civil Rights, you're given an opportunity before all that investigation happens to request to do a mediated agreement. Um, and that's just an opportunity to get in the same room with a trained mediator and the school to say, how can we fix this? How can we move forward? Is oftentimes very successful um, because a lot of times for families and students, what happens is once that full investigation goes into place, OCR will decide what the school has to do to fix it. And you are not entitled to any feedback or weighing in on what that resolution looks like. Um, if you have a good investigator, they might check in with you, make sure it makes sense from your perspective. But it's almost like being a, a victim of a crime where the district attorney's office is now the, are now the people leading the charge on that and not the victim. Similarly here, in the mediation process, you have a lot of control over what that looks like, about what a resolution looks like. Um, but oftentimes when OCR decides there's been a violation, if they decide there's been a violation, the resolution of that they figure out on their own. Um, but really for students with disabilities, OCR provides just, it's just a huge resource. Um, and oftentimes litigation around things like accessibility can be so expensive and so scary, and getting OCR involved is oftentimes a faster way to get that fixed. And then OCR monitors their compliance. So um, it depends on the school, but maybe a school every three months has to send to OCR, okay, here's the architect we hired, here's the construction plans, here's how we're putting the chairlift into the student union. Um, so it's, it's just, for students in post-secondary institutions in particular, it's really helpful. The other thing about Section 504 that I don't want to forget to tell you, though, it's not in the PowerPoint, um, is that when we talk about, and this just, I had a call this morning about a, a student who's being bullied, um, Section 504 protects students with disabilities from being harassed on the basis of their disability. And that's all the way from, um, you know, a, early students all the way through these, through a PhD program or whatever it may be. Um, so while, you know, in an IEP process under the IDEA there are some protections, students should receive FAPE, and FAPE can be interfered with through bullying or harassment. Section 504 is the law that says, um, that really looks at from a civil rights perspective, that disability harassment is not okay, 
um, and, they, and you can enforce student rights for disability harassment through that process. So that's a lot of information. I am sorry that the use of Section 504 in the K-12 setting wasn't necessarily a focus of this, though I can give you guys resources on that. Um, but my, my main goal today is that you have a general overview of the special education process, <clears throat> that you understand the importance and the power of transition planning for students who are moving into post-secondary settings and what that post-secondary setting looks like from a civil rights perspective for individuals with disabilities and how to get academic adjustments so that you can fully participate in that higher education or post-secondary setting. And that's the end of my prepared information for you all. Are there any questions about that piece or any other questions that come up from earlier in your mind that I can answer? For anyone who joined us later, I just want to re-plug, and, and I, I talked to Patty, and she's going to make sure that you all get an email with this information as well. But we are going to have um, education rights clinics, IEP clinics for families um, in Westmoreland County on, with Achieva, in Westmoreland County on October 10th, in Beaver County on October 15th, and here in the Achieva offices in Pittsburgh on October 17th. That is an opportunity for families to come um, here, a very, very shortened, different version of this presentation is that I'll, I'll probably will do my top 10 tips for IEPs. Um, sometimes we do a top, top 10 tips for IEP meetings themselves or preparing for the school year. And then families, you can bring your education records with you. And myself and my colleagues will sit down, go through those records with you, strategize about next steps, see if we can do some issue spotting um, around how to make sure that your student is getting faith and being successful and being happy in school. Registration will not be required, but I highly recommend it only because it helps me make sure I have enough colleagues here to give everyone enough time um, to be able to sit down and have a real conversation. You will get an email about that. <laughs> And I'll make sure that Patty has that. And I would also say, um, if you if if you would like, my card's up there. You can email me. You can go to our website itself. We have an amazing resource, and I and I say that as someone who used it for years before I jo joined McAndrews. Um, we put out probably on a weekly basis these, these newsletters called MLO Minutes, um, and we and if you're on our email list, it I mean. It kind of runs the gamut of all kinds of things. I just I, I published one last month that was about what is an LTS, the local task force, if any of you are involved in that. What is an LTS and how do I get involved in making systemic change in my school district for students with disabilities? Um, to, you know, we put out our top 10 tips for IEPs at the beginning of the school year. There's special needs planning information that comes out. But we also use that MLO Minute to let you know when we have these opportunities for free counsel available. Um, or when speaking engagements like this, this you know, information about this engagement went, went out through our MLO minutes as well. So it's really a huge resource, um, and I promise we don't, you know, we don't send out 25 mass emails a day saying um, send, me a re send me a retainer check or anything like that. It re we really do see that as a community service to provide um, and trying to make sure that families are learning how to self-advocate and learning the information they need. That, you know, someday we'd love to work ourselves out of business in our hearts. <laughs> um, so, so I highly encourage you to sign up for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, Get records for IEP and you know, the IEP 
so but it, I, I, it, it astounded me by the amount that they failed to, you know, really go by way of Absolutely. So for those of you listening online, <clears throat> our audience member who spent some time um, working with school districts was just expressing her shock when she was doing that work at how often um, it seemed that both goals weren't outlined and then when they were, the progress reports, it wasn't, the progress wasn't monitored and progress reports weren't provided um, in addition, kind of an avalanche snowball of things <clears throat> and asking whether I'm still seeing that. What I will say to that is that once someone gets to me, then, you know, I, I think in general for someone to go to a lawyer, they have to, they oftentimes are in a bad place. I mean, quite frankly, oftentimes when someone gets to me, I'm like, why didn't you call me three years ago? Um, but with that said, so, you know, I, I will preface this by saying I probably see the worst of it, um, but you saying that does not surprise me or shock me whatsoever. Yes. So progress monitoring is a huge issue because here's the thing. If we're progress monitoring, we're going to do a better job, right? If I make a to-do list on Monday morning of what I personally am going to do for that week, I'm going to get more done than if I don't, um, if I don't hold myself accountable. And that's certainly true. And again, that's why early on I said it's so important that we use these IEP documents. We use them to get things in writing. We make sure that we're getting progress monitoring. When we don't get any feedback from the school about progress, that we're demanding that. Um, and you're not demanding something that's that hard to do. You're not demanding something that you're not entitled to, right? You're demanding something that should be, I mean, quite frankly, I would argue that in a, in a best practices world, every student should be having this sort of like intense progress monitoring, but we all know that our education systems aren't, aren't, aren't given the kind of financial resources um, that they need to always have best practices, which is frustrating. And, you know, Achieva does a lot of work on special education funding that they can tell you more about as well. Um, but yes, it's a huge issue, and I think that from my perspective, um, progress monitoring and progress reporting and, and laying out consistent and clear goals is really important on students making success. Because at the end of the day, you know, that's, like I said, I would love to work myself out of the job. I would, the people, myself and my colleagues, we do this work because we care about students and we believe in the power of education and we want to make sure that our students who most likely if they've gotten to us are a member of some vulnerable population are getting what they need. And the best way, one of the best ways to make sure that's happening is to make sure we have strong goals written down that are clear, that we're doing progress monitoring, and that that progress monitoring is being reported out to the family in a consistent and timely basis. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> so the question online is, how do we get sensory needs addressed in K-12 education? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I, so if you want to talk about broadly how do we get sensory needs addressed in K-12 education, then, you know, continue to get involved in grassroots programs, get, programs, get involved in your local task force, get involved in your Achieva or your local ARC affiliate, um, wherever you live. To, 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 to work with other parents to make sure that school districts know about best practices, that they're being implemented in the classroom, and that professional um, development is given to all teachers, not just our special education teachers, but all classroom teachers, all administrators, not just those in the special education office about sensory needs. For your individual student, what does that mean? Um, again, the horrible lawyer answer of it depends and call me. Um, but quite frankly, what that means is, is oftentimes getting a really robust evaluation um, that has some really strong recommendations about what the issues are and how they can be addressed. Um, and, you know, the exhausting part of it is just you have to keep pushing. You have to keep pushing. You have to keep asking. And for those of you who I know are in the early intervention stage or the elementary stage, it is a marathon, and you just have to keep pushing on what best practices are, um, what evidence-based practices are, what we know, um, and advocating for your child. And there's so many organizations out there like Achieva, like Peel, um, others that, that can help you with that advocacy piece, can help you with how to self-advocate, how to 
educate your school district as a parent how to be involved in that. Um, and I, I encourage you to get involved in your local task force to push those issues. Um, but, but for individuals, again, if, if that's an issue for you or your child, um, you know, ask for help, reach out, you know, let, let me or my colleagues know um, if you're having some issues getting what is appropriate for your child and, and how we can help make sure that's happening for you. Yes, ma'am. have kids who have ADD or ADHD who don't need an IEP, who don't qualify for, for special education, but who have a 504 plan that says things like, you know, the student will have um, those, those tennis ball kickers under their seat, or they'll have some sort of a hand manipulative, um, or they'll be able to, to stand up to do their work as opposed to sitting in a desk. Um, so those things can certainly be done through a 504 plan, um, and are done through, a five, through 504 plans. But, you know, a family in transition, um, you, know, you can always ask the school district for an evaluation, a further evaluation if needed. Um, but looking at things, at smaller things like manipulatives and that sort of thing for ants in their pants, um, I would also say, you know, recess, um, exposure to outside physical activity as the mom of two little boys who always have ants in their pants um, are huge things as well. But that's, 504 plans can be used in that. Um, they don't have to have seven I mean, categories. Seven it has to be, so if you look at the, let me just pull the PowerPoint to the page. If you look at what the 504, the 504 requirement, and I'm sorry if I misunderstood your question. Well, um, I, I didn't think I was clear on it because I'm not clear in my own head. 504 protects any person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the person's major life, life activities. So you would have to argue that whatever that physical impairment is, is limiting their ability to learn, which is a major life activity. Um, will some schools let you do that without a formal diagnosis? Yes, is what I'm saying. Do they have to necessarily? No. I mean, we, I, I've worked with families who get a hard time getting a 504 plan when they have a diagnosis of anything, of, of diabetes or a, a student who has two, or, two um, orthotic legs. Like, you know, it's, it's, that is very dependent. Yeah, if you go to P, if you go to PDE's website, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have the site, but you can look up um, ODR decision, Office of Dispute Resolution, how many filings have been made, and how many decisions have come out from hearing officers. Which, honestly, for me, is sometimes helpful as an attorney just to look and see, like, oh, well, this school district just a year ago had a case on my issue. Like, 
I know they have the resources, I know they know, and you can sometimes look in there and even figure out who in the district might be the point person that you should be reaching out to um, as a you know, as a parent or if you, if you have an advocate as opposed to an attorney. Um, but the, the PDE website, in theory, should, should, be, should have that sort of information available to families. Maybe they school district went through this once. Maybe they won't want to go through it a year. They don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's yeah, such a multi rather not keep good records and just go. Yeah. That's yeah. what the yeah, I mean, and I. Like, we'll Sorry. No, it's there is there is there is certainly there is certainly an education funding and special education funding issue in Pennsylvania, and you can go to any of these statewide organizations' websites and see lots of ways to get involved in that strategic um, in those strategic movements, trying to change things and make them better. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for having me. It's really been my pleasure.